Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you all for uh, for coming this afternoon or this evening. I'm not used to giving talks at 8 p.m. They don't do that in America. Um, but you guys live nightlives. So I'm going to make an assumption about everybody here, which I think is a safe assumption, but, but uh, yell at me if it's not. I'm going to assume that we all here understand and know that capitalism works. Works in the sense of no. I mean, I see laughter. You don't know if it works or not. Okay. Anybody not agree or, or not sure? No, it's important. Seriously? Okay. I'll say a little bit about it just to, just to, and, and you can ask questions. But I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume a certain understanding of, the, of capitalism as an economic system works. And what I mean by works is that it creates wealth, that it creates production, that it raises a standard of living. And I believe that the idea that capitalism works, the idea that it creates wealth, that it raises a standard of living, is pretty self-evident. I don't think this is hard. I think this is simple. I think that anybody who knows anything about history should get it. I think anybody who knows anything about the world and has maybe traveled a little bit about, around the world should get it. And that the real mystery that all of us, or well, those of us who believe in capitalism, have to deal with is the question of why they don't get it. Why is the struggle for free markets, why is the struggle for capitalism so difficult? Why is it so difficult to convince people out there that indeed capitalism works, that it's in their interest, that they should support it? Because clearly, you know, at least in America and, and uh, you know, I'd say Europe as well, we're losing the battle. We've been losing the battle for a hundred years. Those of us who believe in capitalism, those of us who believe in free markets, who believe in freedom, in individual liberty, we've been losing the battle for a hundred years. In terms of economic freedoms, the Western world, Europe, the United States, were freer a hundred years ago than they are today. And we are moving away from economic freedom. At, a, at least again in the U.S. at an ever accelerating rate. And the question is why, given, in a sense, the self-evidency of the fact that it works. And what do I base this idea that it's self-evident? And again, I'll do this quickly. I usually spend more time on this, but I'll do it quickly because I assume you guys know this stuff. History. For the last 250 years, we've been running a social, political, economic experiment in the world. We've tried all kinds of systems in all kinds of places around the world, right? We tried communism. We've tried pretty close to capitalism, 19th century industrial revolution, capitalism in America. And we've tried lots of different mixtures in between. A little bit of freedom, lots of state control, you know, lots of freedom, a little bit of state control, all the variations that we tried. And that's pretty much a direct correlation between wealth creation, rising standard of living, benefits to the, to the poor even, of the more economic freedom you allow, the greater the benefits, the greater the wealth, the greater the prosperity. And yet we move away from it. And again, this is history. You know, everybody's uh, complaining about, uh, you know, right now the discussion uh, in Europe and in the U.S., it's big in the U.S. right now. It's about inequality, right? This whole issue of inequality. Well, 250 years ago, there was very little inequality. Why is that? Why was there very little inequality 250 years ago? Because everybody was poor. 95, 96, 99% of the people were poor. And there were a few aristocrats over here who lived off of these poor people. But that's it, right? So when you look at history, you see 250 years ago, everybody's poor. You look at the world 100 years later, then 200 years later, then 250 years later, and what you see is ever-improving human conditions. And when you look at what caused this, or when you look at what's happening in parallel, what you see is political freedom, industrial revolution, capitalism, 
freedom, economic freedom. And the correlation is right there. It's right in front of you historically. You can also look at this cross-sectionally, right? You can look at this different geographies. In the same period of time, different countries have tried different systems. And again, you can see the same type of behavior. Countries where you have more freedom do better than countries where you have less freedom. Now, it's not always easy to measure economic freedom, but generally, this is the case. And, you know, the, again, the, the, the examples here are fairly obvious. If you look at Asia over the last 50 years, what stands out as a huge success? Anybody here been to Hong Kong? Nobody, nobody's ever been to Hong Kong. You have, yeah. Everybody should go to Hong Kong at least once in their lives. Um, Hong Kong is an amazing place. What was Hong Kong like 75 years ago? 75 years ago, Hong Kong was a little fishing village. There was nothing there. Hong Kong has no natural resources. It's a rock. It's basically a mountain with nothing. It's a, it's a hard place even to build homes because it's very steep. Today, seven and a half million people live on this mountain or on the bottom of it. Seven and a half million. The per capita GDP of the seven and a half million average is about the same as the United States in 75 years. And what did they have on this rock? What did... What, what brought all these people there? Because they weren't born there, right? They all came. And what brought them there? Freedom. Freedom right? There was no safety net. There's no social services. There's no, you know, there's, a, there's, there's no socialized health care. There's, there's, all the British did when they established Hong Kong is provide property rights. That's it. I mean, some services, and the, I think there's a minimal safety net. But basically what they did was provide property rights. Millions of people flocked in and have done phenomenally well in the place. Right across, you can see China, which didn't allow property rights for a very long time. And where millions and millions and millions, tens of millions of people starved to death. Right? The contrast is amazing. Socialism, capitalism. And yet, when China basically allowed for some private property in some areas. It's pseudo-private property. They pretended they allowed people to have private property. They gave them some economic freedom. They eliminated controls and regulations. What happened in those regions, just in those parts, just in the geographic areas where China allowed this, boom, you got unbelievable economic activity. Again, millions of people coming in, not millions, tens of millions of people, probably the largest human migration ever within a country. All these people from, who are subsistence farming, moving into these areas and building businesses, creating wealth, building prosperity at an amazing rate. Other areas in China where the government kept the controls, nothing, nothing changed. And in these places, you saw the wealth created. So again, everywhere you look, everywhere you literally look, all you need is eyes and a little bit of hist knowledge of history. What you see is capitalism success. What you see is that economic freedom works from a material perspective. It creates, it helps create wealth. Rising standard of living, the poor do better. So why do we turn our backs on this? The evidence is right there in front of us. And yet we choose to ignore it. And it's not that we don't understand why this happens. We, we understand the economic theory that leads to the wealth creation. We've had great economists. We have no shortage. I mean, we always have a shortage. But we've had some really great economists who've gone through and explained what happens under capitalism and why wealth is produced. We've had a whole string of Austrian economists who've explained this, who've told us. And nobody's refuted what they've said. So it's not that we can see this with our eyes, but we don't understand why it works. And therefore, you know, we think if we tinker with it, we'll make it better. We understand why it works. Well, the knowledge is there if we chose to actually apply ourselves and study it. But again, the Western world ignores that economic knowledge. It ignores history. It ignores the facts of reality. It ignores what's evident, self-evident right out there. And we have to go back to the question, why? How is this possible?
people see this as being successful, see its success, and yet turn their backs to it and ignore it. And my argument is that the problem with people is not their knowledge of history. The problem with people is not their knowledge of economics, not that they don't have eyes. Is that there's a more fundamental belief set that they have that shapes the way they use their eyes, that shapes the way they understand history, that shapes the way they approach economics. When they don't want to see something, they don't see it. They evade it. When they don't want to believe the history, they just ignore it. When they don't want to believe the economic theory, they pretend it doesn't exist and they create economic theories that are so complex that they can spend their whole life doing little mathematical equations around it and ignore reality completely. So what is it? What are these fundamental ideas that cause people not to see reality as it is? Not to be willing to acknowledge the incredible success of free markets and capitalism it has. And let me just, just, just for the sake of, of, of uh, definitional sake, when I say free markets, I mean free markets. Free of what? What does freedom mean? Freedom yeah, freedom from coercion. Freedom from force. Right? So free markets mean markets in which force is not exerted. And who usually exerts force on markets? The state. The government. So it's Free of regulation, free of control, free of taxes, free of the things that manipulate the change behavior. So free markets means no government involvement in markets. Or okay. well, the only government involvement in markets is to catch the crooks and the fraudsters, the people who exert coercion themselves. You have to, ex you know, you have to say this these days because people believe we have free markets today. And it has to be clear that what we have today is very unfree. Our markets are filled with regulations and controls and taxes and all kinds of government interventions into what we do. And, you know, and, and, and if, if you want my view on what caused the financial crisis, why it wasn't capitalism and it couldn't have been capitalism, it's impossible that it was capitalism, you know, you can ask me in the Q&A. So what's going on? Why are people so resistant to free markets? So what are, what are free markets about? What is the essence of free markets? What do people do when they go to the market? What are they trying to do? Trying to do what? Trade. trade. Markets are about trade, right? But what is the purpose of the trade? Why do we trade? To improve our lives. To improve, you trade in order to improve whose life? Your own life. People go into the marketplace in order to attempt, at least, to make their lives better. So the producers, the people who make this stuff, right, do it why? Why does Steve Jobs make an iPhone? Why? To make money, right? And you chuckle a little bit because, you know, we are culturally ingrained to think making money is a little embarrassing, right? But... These things, it's true. I mean, every, everywhere you go, right? It's, it's, it's a little uncomfortable to say, this is to make money. But it is. These things had profit margins of 60% when they were first came out, right? If he didn't want to make money, he would have sold them a lot cheaper. Okay. Steve Jobs, was it only about money? Is the money the only reason he made this? Yeah, I mean, he loves this, right? This is a passion, vision. He, you know, this is his... He loves creating beautiful stuff. It's his vision, right? So, but whose vision is it? Who, who loves doing this? Steve Jobs. So, what motivates Steve Jobs? Is it me who motivates Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs gets up every morning and says, I want to maximize social utility. And they're finally going to make an iPhone? No, what does he wake up thinking every morning when he, when he goes to work? I love this stuff. I'm having fun. And I'm making money. That's part of what he says. So what's it about? 
making stuff is about him. Steve Jobs is self-interested when he makes the iPhone. He's self-interested when he makes my iPhone. And I like, to, I like to say that in 2008, when I went to buy my first iPhone, uh, it's when it came out, I went to, I went to buy it because I wanted to stimulate the economy. Right? Because I was worried the economy was spiraling out of control. Because and, and, I know, that's why you guys go shopping. Because you care about your fellow man. And, 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 and you want to make sure people have jobs. And you don't want them to lose. No, right? That's why you go shopping. I won't ask who goes shopping for that reason. I don't want to embarrass you. But why do you go shopping? To make what? Yeah, to make your life better. So the producer of the iPhone is being self-interested. He's trying to do this because he loves it, because he wants to make money. You buy it because you want a better life, because you think this will be more productive, because you think it's cool, because you think this will improve your life in some capacity, in some way. So what are markets about? Markets about people coming together and engaging in what? In trade for the purpose of improving their own lives. Markets, any market, is about self-interest. The essence of the marketplace is self-interest. Now, this is not a new observation. This is not Ayn Rand. This is not me, right? This is Adam Smith, right? Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations says, the baker bakes the bread not because he cares about any of you. He doesn't, you're not the goal of baking the bread. The goal of baking the bread is to take care of himself, take care of the people he loves, make a living for himself. And the grocery store who buys the bread from the baker and sells it to you doesn't care about you or the baker. It cares about making a living, it cares about taking care of themselves, about the people they love. Fundamental to the marketplace is self-interest. Businessmen are self-interested. They're there to make money. They're there to, to, to live, to be productive because they enjoy being productive. Because that's how they, you know, manifest themselves in the world. It's about pursuing self-interest. Both sides. All transactions. And who, who loses from all of this, from this trade stuff when, you know, we've got people here who all being self-interested, right? I, I bought the iPhone and Apple made a lot of money off of this. Does that mean I lost? No, right? This is basic economics. Why didn't I lose? If I bought the iPhone for $300, how much is the iPhone worth to me? $300? It has to be more. If it was worth $300, what would happen? I would be indifferent. I wouldn't bother, right? So in my pocket, iPhone, eh, maybe I'll buy it, maybe I won't, probably stay home, right? But the reason I buy it is because it's worth more than 300. So when I give up my 300, I'm getting something that to me is worth more than it. That's why I'm willing to give up the 300. Every trade, you're getting something that is worth more to you than the money you're putting down. If you go and buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store, I don't know how much it costs, two euro? How much? Half a euro. Half a euro. That is cheap here. <laughs> okay, in America it costs more. Half a euro, the bread is worth more to you than half a euro. That's why you're willing to give up the half euro. Here's one that's, that's hard for people. Um, maybe not this group, but, but, but people out there. If you make 30,000 euros a year at your job, how much is your time worth to you? How much is your time worth to you? Less than 30,000. How much is it to, worth to your employer? More than 30,000. They make a profit off of you, otherwise they wouldn't hire you. And you're better off for having the job, otherwise you wouldn't have the job. So your time is worth less than the 30,000, but your Work is worth more than 30000 to your employer. So trade, who loses? When you buy the iPhone, who loses? No one. It's a win-win relationship. 
both parties are better off. You're better off because you have the iPhone. Apple's better off because they have the cash. So trade is a win-win. But let's think about this idea of self-interest. What do we know about self-interest? What have we been taught since we were this big about self-interest? It's generally bad, right? I mean, I, I grew up in a good Jewish household, right? My mother tried to teach me right and wrong from wrong. And she told me when I was little, she said, think of yourself last. Think of others first. Be selfless. Be selfless. The opposite of selfish. Which means don't think of yourself. Now there's a sense in which she didn't mean any of that. Right? Because every mother wants her children to be successful and they want them to be, to, to, you know, to really be driven and so on. And those are all self-interested activities. But we say it to our children. We promote it as a moral ideal to be, to be selfless, to think of others first, to sacrifice, right? If you think about in, in, in the West today, what, what does nobility mean? What does goodness mean? What does morality mean? What does virtue mean? It means what? It means sacrifice. It means being selfless. It means serving others. It means living for others. It doesn't mean helping others. We'll get to helping others in a minute. It means putting yourself down for others. That's what nobility, goodness, virtue literally mean. So we look at this businessman and these marketplaces and what are they about? Self-interest. But we've been taught that self-interest is bad. Morally bad. Maybe it works economically, but it's yucky. And we're taught that what's good, everything opposite. Being selfless is good. And does selflessness work in the marketplace? No, the marketplace isn't about self. And everybody knows this. Everybody in the world knows that markets are about being people being self-interested. Everybody knows this. And they know it's bad. So when something bad happens in the world, who are they going to blame? All those selfish people, because they have, it has to be their fault, because we know that morally they're bad people, because they're being self-interested. And that equals, in their mind, being bad. So nobody waits when a financial crisis happens. Nobody waits for the facts. Nobody waits for data. Nobody waits for any information. We know, that deep down in our gut, we know that capitalism caused it. We know. Who is the representative of capitalism? Who is the most evil of all capitalists? What's that? The bankers. The bankers, right? It's always the bankers' fault. Always. For thousands of years, it's been bankers' fault. Because we know bankers are the most self-interested. Because they're about, they don't have a product to hide behind, right? They can't say, look what I've given you. They're all about profit and money. That's all it is, right? So they are perceptually, simplistically maybe, they are the most self-interested of all of them, and therefore it must be their fault. And we do this time and time and time again. Because our fundamentally, our morality is what drives us. People want to be good. They don't necessarily want to be rich. They want to be good. They want to be just. They want to be right. And notice that the left plays on this heavily. Obama doesn't argue economics in America. He argues justice and fairness and goodness. Right? He argues ethics. The left rarely gets into debates of economics, really, when it comes down to it. They really are about fairness and justice and good. And we've all agreed with them. We've given them. Right? We've all agreed. That what's good is being selfless. What's good is sacrifice. Nobody ever challenges that. Nobody ever questions that. I mean, think, think about somebody like uh, Bill Gates, right? Microsoft. He made a lot of money, $70 billion. Right? Talk about income inequality. That's big income inequality. How did he make his money? How do you make money? How do you make money? 
We just talked about trades. How do you make it? Selling a product. But if you make a lot of money, what does it mean that the product is what? It means it's really valuable to a lot of people, right? Bill Gates sold lots of pieces of software, $100 at a time. And some software more expensive, say like businesses and so on. But he sold a lot of them because a lot of people valued what he had to sell. And every person who bought the software paid $100 for it, but got how much out of it? A lot more than $100. Otherwise, they wouldn't have paid $100. And it turns out, particularly if you look backwards, that they got probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars out of it. If you think about how your life has improved because of the existence of Microsoft that standardized platforms, that created software that we can all use to communicate with one another, the whole computer revolution is to a large extent a Microsoft revolution, at least in terms of making it so consumer friendly. So he improved the lives of how many people? By selling them a product, by becoming rich. He made the world a better place for how many people? Billions. Almost everybody in the planet has been touched by Microsoft. Almost everybody in the planet has a better life because Bill Gates became a billionaire. And yet, how much moral credit, ethical credit, does Bill Gates get for helping all these people? None. He actually gets some negative credit. Why does he get negative credit? Why does he get negative credit? Because he made a lot of money. So he was self-interested, and that's bad. So even though he helped everybody in the world, everybody has a better life, he is still considered a bad guy because he benefited while helping them. And you can see this more real because when does Bill Gates become a good guy? When he leaves Microsoft, starts a foundation, and starts giving his money away. How many people will Bill Gates help by giving his money away? I mean, he'll help thousands maybe, maybe tens of thousands, but not billions. Not billions. But he gets lots of moral credit for that, right? Because he's not benefiting. He's just giving. More than that, he's still a little suspect. We still don't trust him completely. He's not like Mother Teresa heroic. right? Why not? What's the problem with Bill Gates today? He's still rich, and he seems to be enjoying giving the money away. He's having some fun doing it, and that's self-interested again. And that's no good. So how would we generate, how do we get Bill Gates to be a saint, right? How would we get Bill Gates to be a moral hero that people write songs about and poets will sing his praises? What's that? What's that? Yeah, but okay, so but make it real. Like he'd have to give all his money away, right? And he'd have to move into a tent because he still lives in a big house. And what would really help is if he could bleed a little bit. Blood goes a long way to getting you sainthood. He needs to suffer. Suffering somehow is good. Sacrifice is noble. Giving the wealth that you created is good, but creating it, uh uh-uh, that's no good. That's suspect. Now, think about, now this is the culture we live in. This is the moral code we have around us. This is the world we live in. So uh, is anybody surprised that we don't have capitalism? I mean, capitalism is about the self-interest part. It's not about giving. It's about creating. It's about building. It's about making. It's about pursuing self-interest. But we don't trust this. We hate this. What we like is the giving. What's giving consistent with? Giving and sacrifice. What political system is that consistent with? It's socialism. All socialism does is help you give. Right? It says you won't do it voluntarily. None of us do enough of it voluntarily. So we'll tax you. We'll use a little bit of coercion to make you better people by getting you to give more. And it works. Because what happens, and this is the guilt part in capitalism without guilt, right? What happens when people believe, when you as an individual believe that nobility, goodness, lies and sacrificing and giving and working for other people and living for other people, 
But you make money, are in business, live a self-interested life. You care about your family more, about more than about strangers. What does that create inside of you? Your moral ideal is over here, but you're living somewhere else. What does that create inside? Guilt. A conflict. And that conflict is guilt. That's what guilt is all about. And guilt is an incredibly powerful tool to use people, to manipulate people. Just ask any Jewish or Catholic mother, and she'll tell you, right? This is the way to control people, to use guilt on them. So you take these businessmen, right, and you tell them that this is their moral ideal and they're living here, and you say, look, guys, you, you, you're living this selfish, self-interested life, but your moral responsibilities to the poor, the needy, whoever, we're going to help you become a better person. All we need is to raise your taxes a little bit. You should be giving more. And what do rich people do? They say no. So Obama, when he ran for president in the United States, and most of my examples are American, so I apologize, but that's what I know. Obama ran for president. He promised to raise taxes on the rich, a promise he's fulfilled, but he promised to raise taxes on the rich. How did the rich vote? For Obama or against Obama? A vote for Obama meant they were voting to raise their own taxes. Eight of the wealthiest counties Eight of the ten wealthiest counties in the United States voted for Obama. Voted to raise their own taxes. I'll well, take another example. In California, we just raised taxes on the rich by 30%. From 10% to 13%. This is just the state income tax on top of the federal income tax, right? 10 to 13%. And it was a referendum, so we all got to vote on it in the last election. Straight question. Are you for or against raising taxes on the rich? How do you think the rich voted? For? Because of guilt. Because of guilt. It's not that these rich are benefiting from government taxing them. It's that they're suffering from government taxing them. And yet they vote for it. Because they feel guilty. And they should feel guilty. They're not living up to their moral code. That induces guilt. So this, in my view, the moral code that our culture has is completely inconsistent with capitalism, completely inconsistent with free markets, completely inconsistent with individual liberty, and we're seeing the consequence of that in the world out there. We're seeing policy after policy after policy, which is a rejection of capitalism, which is a rejection of moving towards free markets. And even when we see short periods of liberalization, short periods of a little bit more economic freedom. As soon as the next crisis hits, everything goes back to the way it was. You get the Reagan years, bam, they disappear within a decade. Because there's no fundamental shift. People are focused on the small code, and which causes them to reject anything resembling free markets. And it works the other way too, right? So not only do we have a positive perception of sacrifice, what do we have, what, what perception do we have concretely of self-interest? What do we associate in our minds self-interested behavior with? We don't think he's self-interested, therefore he's creating value, he's creating wealth, he's, everybody's better off because of it. That's not what we think. That's not what we've been taught. When my mother told me, think of yourself last, what she told me is if you think of yourself first, that means you'll do what? Hurt others. You'll lie, steal, cheat, stab people in the back, do anything to get your way. We have a choice in ethics presented to us by the moralists of our time, really of the last 2,000 years. You can be a self-sacrifice, a selfless person, somebody who thinks of himself last, or you could be a crook. Those are the two options. Self-interest means crook. Self-interest means lying, cheating, stealing. Selfless means saint. That's it. Those are the two options. So when a businessman is a crook, Bernie Madoff, let's say, what do, what do people immediately think? They think, of course, all businessmen are crook. 
They're all self-interested. We just happen to catch him. And this became really evident to me in uh, 2002. And I don't know if you guys remember this but or know this. But in America, there was a few scandals where a number of businessmen were caught committing fraud. Enron, you remember Enron, and there was WorldCom. There were a few of them, Tyco. And uh, there's a show on, on Fox, uh, Bill O'Reilly. You probably heard of Bill O'Reilly. He's this uh, obnoxious. Um, anyway, Bill O'Reilly, reflecting populism, said, look, we caught five CEOs cheating. They're all self-interested bastards. And I can guarantee you that everybody, they're all crooks. He wanted to fire every CEO in America. He wanted them all gone. Because, you know, we just happen to catch these guys, but they're all crooks because they're all what? They're all self-interested. And self-interest equals, in our minds, being a crook. I, 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 to be on a sh I went on a show to defend businessmen against all being fired, right? For, for this. That's how absurd this kind, this kind of stuff gets. And the United States passed massive regulations in 2002. People forget this. Uh, something called Sarbanes-Oxley. It doesn't really matter, but the point is that the consequence of a few guys committing fraud was that all business in America was massively regulated. Massively. Regulation cost the U.S. economy by some estimates north of $1.5 trillion. That's a T. Because of this assumption, they must be all be crooks. So in my view, we need to offer an alternative to this false dichotomy. We need to offer an alternative to this notion that morality is about being selfless, that morality is about serving others, that morality is about denying oneself, which I think is prevalent and dominant out in the culture. And that and the only person to offer such an alternative is Ayn Rand. I mean, it says this is a false dichotomy. It's not about being either selfless or being a crook. There's a third option, and that's being self-interested. Her argument is that being a crook is not self-interested. Lying, stealing, and cheating don't make you a better person. Don't make me you happier. Don't make you more successful. Don't lead to your own human flourishing. Indeed, lying, cheating, stealing are bad for you. If you understand properly what's good for you as a human being, what your nature requires of you. So she says, let's look at human beings and let's evaluate what leads to their success. What leads to human flourishing? What leads to human happiness? And she says, that's what morality, that's what ethics should be about. Ethics shouldn't be about how to sacrifice. How not to live a good life for you, how to serve other people, how to place the well being of other people above your own. That's not ethics, that's suicide. What she does is resurrect the tradition going back to Aristotle, which is the idea that the purpose of ethics is to establish the virtues and values that lead individual human beings to flourish, to be successful. And ultimately to be happy, to live a full life as a human being. And what does that necessitate? And, you know, you can do a lot of, a whole course on, on just what that means, but let's just do a little bit. Okay? What, does it, what does it mean as a human being to flourish, to be successful, to be happy? What, what, what virtues or what value does that really require? Well, what value makes everything that we have around us, makes all other values possible. All the chairs that you're sitting on, the clothes that you wear, the television screen, the, the live streaming, what makes all this possible? Yeah, human reason. I mean, we're a pretty pathetic animal when it comes to our physical nature. I mean, just look around the room. Um, <laughs> we're weak, we're slow, we have no claws. We have no fangs. I mean, try running down a bison and biting into it. I mean, you can't do it. Or, or, or matching up against a saber-toothed tiger. I mean, we're just weak 
physically to deal with the environment in which we're born. We cannot survive nature if what we rely upon is our physicality. What makes us unique, what makes it possible for us to dominate as a species is our mind, is our ability to reason, ability to observe, to understand reality, to identify, to integrate, and to create. That's what's uniquely human, and that's what makes possible life as a human being. And every single aspect of human life depends, in the end of the day, on human individual reason. Because the other flip side of that is there's only individual reason. There's no collective consciousness here. We don't reason. Each one of us can reason. Each one of us can think. Each one of us can observe. We can help each other. We can stimulate each other to think. We can challenge each other to think. But we can't think as a group. There's no such thing as group think. Literally. There's no such thing as collective consciousness. So the value for each individual is the most important value is reason. Is his own capacity to think. The most important virtue, the thing to, 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 to strive towards is rationality. Is to, is to be able to exercise that reason. To use that mind. To create values. And just think about all the notions that, that are presented as self-interested, right? Is lying, is lying, for example, they always say, you know, if you're selfish, you're going you're gonna to lie, right? You're going to get your way any way you can. Is lying selfish? So was Bernie Madoff, you know Bernie Madoff? Was Bernie Madoff selfish? Self-interested? Well, you're the only one who thinks that, so let me see if anybody thinks yes. Was Bernie made of selfish? I mean, commonly, if you ask anybody in the street, they don't say, yes, of course he was selfish. Right? But did Bernie made of, if selfish means taking care of self, making your life the best life that it can be, human flourishing, did Bernie made of flourish? No. And not only because he was caught. Because if you ask Bernie made of today, he will tell you that he's happier today in jail than he was before he was caught. And I believe him. Because lying sucks. Really bad. You can't have human relationships, real human relationships with people you're lying to. And Bernie Manoff, by the way, stole money from his best friends. Right? He couldn't talk to his family in any meaningful sense, because he was lying to them constantly, and he was hiding stuff from them. He was constantly obsessed with the fact that he would be get caught. By whom? Not by the police, but by his family, by his friends, by the people he cared about. Bernie Madoff was miserable, because lying creates misery. It doesn't create flourishing. And Bernie Madoff didn't sit down one day and say, huh, I want to live the best life that I can be. I want to flourish as a human being. So you know what? I'm going to lie, steed, and cheat for my best friends and my family. Nobody does that. What happened? What do you think happened? Bernie made up, saw a pile of money, and he felt, he emoted, I want that. And he took it. He didn't think. He didn't use that one faculty reason, rationality, he didn't think about flourishing, he just wanted, he emoted. It was pure emotion. Most crooks don't think, they emote. They're not being self-interested. If we understand self-interest as being focused on reason, on rationality, it's not rational to steal. It doesn't promote your well-being. It doesn't make you a successful person. It doesn't lead to happiness. If you thought about it, you'd know that that was true. Most people think about it, figure that out pretty quickly. Most people try it, right? We all lie at some point, And we figure out it's not a good strategy for success. In business, it's pretty obvious. All you need is to get caught once and nobody does business with you again. But that's true in relationships. It's true in life generally. And you could go on. You could, I mean, it's not that hard to show that stealing and everything else just is not in your self-interest. 
Self-interest is about creating, producing, building, making stuff. It's about gaining self-esteem. Where does self-esteem come from? What is self-esteem? Self-esteem is the sense that you're worthy of this life, that life is, you know, that you're capable, that you're competent, that you can do stuff. Right? It's not about getting a ribbon. How do you get self-esteem? By what? What? Yeah, by setting goals and achieving them. By striving, by effort, working hard. Without self-esteem, you can't be happy. And where do we spend most of our time? Where do we gain most of our self-esteem? At least in the U.S. In Europe, it's a little different. <laughs> at work. That's right. We spend most of our hours at work. And why do we spend most of our hours at work? Because that's where we challenge ourselves. That's where we push ourselves. That's where we achieve. That's where we gain self-esteem. Productive work is vital to human happiness, to human flourishing, to human success. Working, being productive is a virtue. It's a virtue. Not because it helps society, not because Bill Gates helped everybody else, but because it made his life much, much better. It made his life flourish. It made him happy if, you know, if he took it that way. So work, building, creating is good because it's consistent with human happiness, with human flourishing. And yeah, by the way, everybody else benefits from it as well. Right? Because we're traders. So everybody else, it's like Bill Gates, everybody else benefited. But that's not the moral reason it's good. The moral reason it's good is it because it helps you. So Rand's view is that self-interest, properly understood, long-term, rational self-interest, is the proper ethical system for man. It's the proper way to live. That there's absolutely no reason in the world you should sacrifice. Why? Sacrifice implies that the other person's life is more valuable than your own. How did that happen? So, ethics requires that we re, you know, we, we redefine. We redefine what good means, what right means, what just means, what noble is. To me, Bill Gates is a hero, a moral, ethical hero. Not because he gives his money away. I don't care about giving money away. I mean, it's nice or not nice. Who knows? But because he built something, he created something. He made something of his life. He used his life well. He lived a full life. He exercised his rational capability to its max. He, you know, it's the creation that matters. That's what makes him good. Turns out he has horrible political ideas, but we'll put that aside. This is why Ayn Rand is such a is such a admirer of businessmen, while recognizing that some of them are scoundrels. Right? She admires the essence of what it means to be a businessman, the creation of value, the building of something that didn't exist before, the offering of that value, but making yourself better in the process, both through productive work and through trade. And that's why she is a huge admirer of business. So what we need is a redefinition of ethics. What we need is an ethical revolution. What we need is a moral revolution. And this is why it's so hard. Why our cause is so difficult to bring to the world. Because they, because we never talk in these terms. We think we'll just explain to the world why economically capitalism works and they'll just go, oh, okay. But they don't care that it works. It doesn't matter that it works. It's evil and bad and unjust and unfair. And we never challenge them on those terms. We give them the moral high ground, and then we think everything's going to be okay. Because we talk, we've got the numbers on our side. And they are on our side. The numbers, the history, the economics, all of it is on our side. But what matters is not on our side. Ethics as understood in the world today, is antagonistic towards us, and that is why we lose. If we want to win, we have to dominate the moral high ground. 
We have to capture it. We have to dominate it. We have to change their view of what constitutes moral, what constitutes good, what constitutes ethical, what constitutes noble. If we do that, capitalism is easy. Economics is easy because the facts are on our side and we know the economics. And we can just show them. You're committed to a good life. You're committed to being self-interested. No other system in human history has allowed people to be more successful, to flourish more, to achieve more of their values than capitalism. And you guys should embrace it because it's in your self-interest. First, they have to understand the self-interest is good. So what Ayn Rand calls for, and what we call for in the book that was shown before, is ultimately for a moral revolution, for an ethical revolution. Scrapping the old ethics and replacing them with a new definition, with the idea of rational self-interest. You know, and it's to recapture a certain spirit. And I'll end with this. Recapture the spirit that I think bubbled up a little bit in the Enlightenment. The idea that the purpose of life is the pursuit of happiness, your own happiness. And, you know, it made it into the Declaration of Independence of America because it was at the surface of the Enlightenment. People believed in the idea of the individual's pursuit of happiness. And that's what made that era free. That's what made it possible for that era to be free, is the value people placed on individuals and on their achieving their own happiness. I'll end there and I'll take your questions. Thank you. Hi, how do you reconcile your notion of free markets and high standard of living with the Scandinavian model where they have a large amount of, a large redistribution of wealth, high taxes and arguably one of the highest standards of living in the world? So Scandinavia is interesting. But there are a few things we have to understand. First, Scandinavia is not that different than the rest of the world. So we look at America and we assume America has, uh, you know, free markets. In Scandinavia, they have massive redistribution of wealth. The difference between the United States and, and Scandinavia is an issue of degree, right? Uh, the United States redistributes less wealth than Scandinavia. But the United States regulates business more than Scandinavia. Basically, the West today is all a mixture of government interference in everything that we do. Uh, it redistributes wealth, it regulates, it controls. But each country cho has chosen a different mixture of these. And it's complicated to tell which is freer than which. Now, let's take, let's take Sweden, for example, right? Because I know a little bit about Sweden. And, and Norway is distorted because they have all this oil revenue that comes in and they don't have to do anything. You know, right now they're just living off of natural resources. But, but take Sweden. So Sweden in the, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was one of the freest, most capitalist countries in the world. It had no big social safety net, no redistribution of wealth, very little regulation, almost none. And massive amounts of wealth were created during that period of time. Um, it was by the 1950s, Sweden was one of the richest countries in the world, maybe, you know, really up there, if not the richest. They had very entrepreneurial people, they created incredible businesses, and they did phenomenally well. In the late 50s, early 60s, socialism became very popular, and they decided to start redistributing this wealth. And they did. They became one of the biggest redistributors of wealth uh, in the West. From 1960, you know, late 50s, early 60s until 1994, uh, when they went bankrupt. <laughs> People forget this. But Sweden went bankrupt in 1994. Sweden was Greece. Where Greece is today, Sweden, I mean, better because they had more wealth to start off with. But Sweden was in deep, deep trouble because they basically redistributed much of the wealth that they'd accumulated all that through that period when they had freedom. And since 1994, Sweden has been decreasing their social programs, cutting government spending, eliminating government regulations. They've actually been moving in the opposite direction of most of Europe and certainly of America. And yes, since 1994, their economy is starting to grow again and starting to do well again, 
because of those decreases. And indeed, there's something called the Economic Freedom Index, where um, people rank the, free, the economies of the world based on the level of economic freedom. And anybody want to guess who's number one, two? Hong Kong and Singapore always have been for a long time number one and number two from an economic freedom perspective. Anybody want to guess where the United States is? 12, 13 <laughs> was a few years ago. It's 18. It's 18. Um, and it's dropping, right? It's been dropping. It used to be number three, and it's 18. Sweden, Denmark are actually rated higher than the United States on economic fee. Because in spite of the fact that Sweden taxes more and redistributes more, it regul regulates less. And, it, it, you know, for example, they have school vouchers. Now, it's not, it's not private schools, but school vouchers. The United States doesn't. There are all kinds of things that make Sweden freer. So the problem of comparing countries right now is that it's not obvious what you're comparing. Why is Sweden still wealthy? Sweden is still wealthy because it still has significant amounts of economic freedom in spite of the redistribution of wealth. The question is not, uh, and, and by the way, the more they redistribute, ultimately, we've seen what happens. They go bankrupt. So they have to shrink that down, which is what they do. But the real question is, what could Sweden be if it didn't do all those things? How rich could we be? This is the big problem that we free marketers have. We know things would be a hundred times better without regulations or without redistribution of wealth. A hundred times better. The problem is I don't have a parallel universe that I can show you that on the map. I can't point to. But what I can point to is history. I can point to the wealth creation in Sweden before 1960 and, and the rate of growth, of economic growth and stagnation that Sweden has engaged in since then. Yeah, it's created wealth, but at a much lower rate than it did in the 100 years from the 19th century into the mid-20th century. I can show you the United States. We're wealthier than Swedes. Average per capita GDP in the United States is higher than Sweden. But we're poor. We're dirt poor as compared to what we could be. I mean, there's no reason. There's no economic reason. There's no metaphysical reason. In the United States, GDP which is a flawed number to begin with, but let's just assume it as a proxy for economic growth, couldn't be five, six times what it is today. In other words, instead of 1%, 5%, 6%, 8%. 8%. And I don't know if you know, but a small change in annual GDP makes a huge difference over the long term because of compounding. So if the United States had grown 1% less every year over the last, I think it's 100 years, we would have a standard of living below that of Mexico. 1% makes a huge difference. So Sweden works because it created a lot of wealth when it was free, and it's still free somewhat. The, more, the less free it becomes, the less it works. The more freedom they allow, the better it works. And the, even the Swedish have understood this, and that's why they're actually shrinking their government. The same happened, by the way, to Canada. Canada went bankrupt in the 1990s. And since then, if you look at government spending, it's declined. If you look at regulations, they've declined. If you look at social redistribution of wealth, it's declined. Taxes have declined. And Canada is doing very well relative to the United States, let's say right now, because the United States, everything is in the other direction. So again, the economics always work. It's just a matter of digging into the details. She's not convinced. <laughs> um, I had, <laughs> I have uh, two questions, if yes, possible. Sure. Uh, you said, and you you said that the second half of the nineteenth century was like uh, the best part of capitalism. Uh, the freest time, freest, freest from time. perspective. Yes. And at the same time, it was the hardest time for the humanity who was living at that time, and they were living in misery. And I even read that people who were living at that time were living worse than slaves in Roman time. And second uh, question... Let me answer that question, because I can only handle one at a time. That's just wrong. It's just not true. Um, so let's take, let's take some of the myths associated with the late 19th century. Um, 
people were working long hours. Uh, what kind of hours did people work in the 16th century? Or the 17th century? Or the 18th century? Anybody ever lived on a farm? Actually, they had 83 days during the year in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Eight with church feasts, Sundays, and with everything. They had a lot of free days. When they didn't have free days, how long did they work? During the sunlight. From sunrise to sunset. What did they do in the sunset? They went to sleep because there was nothing else to do. There was no light. There was no light. They couldn't afford lanterns. They couldn't afford lanterns. Almost none of them could read. Almost none of them could read. There was no education. There was a sliver of a population that had an education. And what kind of work did they work? Very physical work. What was life expectancy before the late 19th century? 36 in Europe, Western Europe, 36. Um, what, did, what about children? Oh, because during the Industrial Revolution, children worked. Historical abomination, right? What did children do before the Industrial Revolution? Worked from sunrise to sunset, and then they went to sleep. How many children got educated? Almost none. Unless you were born an aristocrat, you didn't get an education. Late 19th century, fast forward, right? Long hours, but not sunrise to sunset. Um, children are working, but children, uh, child labor is in decline. Why is child labor in decline towards the end of the 19th century? Why are they getting education? Well, because the parents became rich enough. They made enough money so they didn't have to have the kids work to feed themselves. So they took them out of work and put them in schools. Because for the first time in all of human history, the first time, people were making more wealth than what they consumed. For the first time in human history, people, working class people, everybody had a surplus. And that surplus allowed them to pull kids out of work and get them an education. How about life expectancy? What happened to life expectancy? By the late 19th century, life expectancy had gone to over 50 and coming close to 60. Um, worse than slaves. Wow. Um, could you leave your job and go find another one? Yeah. I mean, millions of people liked this idea of capitalism so much, tens of millions of people, that they were willing to leave their ancestral homes. They were willing to leave the farming, which was a horrible life, right? This is why they're like horrible. Farming is one of the most horrible. I mean, when we're talking about farming with your hands, because you can't even afford the beast that'll, that'll do it. You're literally doing it with your hands, like so many peasants did. That they were willing to leave their ancestral homes, never to see their families again, and get on a ship to go to wherever, right? To the United States of America, or to, or to, or to, or to South America, or to South Africa, or wherever, just to escape, right? Their farm life. So they came to Britain, right? Because they wanted, because capitalism produced more jobs than there were people. So you could bring all these immigrants in, and they all found work. And their work allowed them a standard of living that they couldn't even imagine when they were on the farm. They couldn't even imagine. So it's completely false picture of the late 19th century. This is exactly the picture that Piketty and a lot of these inequality people want you to believe. It's the picture that the left wants you to believe, but it is not true. The late 19th century is when the middle class was created. And you say, what middle class? There is no middle class. But what, what was Marx talking about when he talks about the bourgeoisie? That's the middle class, right? There was no middle class in 1600. There was no middle class in the 1700s. There was no bourgeois in the 16 and 1700s. When did the bourgeois come into being? In the 19th century. And we, and we know that they exist because Marx writes about them. Right? And then I'm told in America, people tell me, oh no, the middle class was created in the 1950s by the unions. That's what created the middle class. I mean, that's nuts. The middle class was created by the Industrial Revolution, by people increasing their productivity and creating a surplus. What does it mean to be middle class? Middle class means that you have a surplus, that your standard of living is rising, that you can afford to invest, that you can afford to save, that you can afford to buy things that you couldn't even imagine previously. 
late part of the 19th century, one of the, one of the greatest periods for human beings ever. I mean, think beyond that. Think, you know, let's get away from business, right? Because business is about money and people don't like it. <laughs> what, else, what else is going on in the 19th century in Europe? Right? You, get, you get an explosion in the arts, an explosion. Suddenly, people can afford to paint and to write music and to write novels and to do all these things that before they needed a patron, they need some aristocrat. And if the aristocrat turned his back on them, they were dead. They would starve, but they had to go and do some manual labor. Why could they suddenly, why is it that suddenly, uh, you know, Liszt, who's a pianist, can go on a tour of Europe and live off of the money that he makes touring Europe? Why? Because suddenly all of us, poor workers who are suffering like slaves in Rome, have money, have money to buy concert tickets to go see Liszt play a piano. And gain enormous spiritual value from the experience of listening to him. Could we afford to go and watch Mozart play a piano? No. Nobody would let you in. Only aristocrats got to listen to Mozart. Common people didn't. I mean, he wrote one opera, right? Um, Magic Flute for the comedy theater where poor people went and it was cheap. But great music was for the rich, for the, for the aristocrats, for the rich who made their money by stealing, not made their money by producing. But by the 19th century, artists could become rich because there were millions of us consuming their goods. You can see it in Beethoven. Beethoven, in the beginning of his career, completely dependent on aristocrats. By the end of his career, people are paying money to come to his concerts. Where did these people come from? Capitalism. From the Industrial Revolution. Suddenly you had a middle class that had excess money that they could go buy concert tickets. They could buy a novel. Why could they buy a novel? Because they could read, because they had time to be educated. They had time to learn how to read. How many people knew how to read in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries? As compared to the 19th, suddenly, boom, an explosion in literacy. That's not public education. That's people having time and money to educate themselves. So, everything you be told about the 19th century, and this is part of the scheme, this is part of how they sell this stuff. Everything you've been told about the 19th century is basically wrong. It's true about living standards. I mean, the fact that it's wrong is true about living standards. It's true about the economics. It's true about the evil robber barons and the monopolies and all. Everything they've taught you about it is wrong because they don't want you to know the truth. Because they want you to continue the myth that allows them to continue this idea of socialism. Because as I said, history is on the side of capitalism. So the socialists have to rewrite history in order to win. You had a second question. Uh, well, basically, you said, for example, you paid your iPhone one hundred dollars. You had, you said that Bill Gates, that Bill Gates <laughs> took like sixty-five dollars of that iPhone, and forty-five were actual costs. Yeah. From that forty-five, forty is plastic, and five dollars is. Maybe for a child in China who was making it. Maybe. And you think that's good. I think it's wonderful. And ethical. I think it's wonderful and unbelievably ethical. Because what is the option for the child? What's that? To stop. Why do children go to work? Nobody, no parent wants their children to go to work unless they have to. Because otherwise they'll starve. And China is a great example of this. I mean, you go and you, you, you go to the factories where Chinese laborers are putting this together. And yes, you would be horrified because you sit here in middle class Europe and you think, oh, I would never want to work in those conditions. But you've never been a subsistence farmer. You haven't been in one of those collective farms in, in uh, West, I always get that mixed up, Western China and barely survived. You forget that under Mao, during the Cultural Revolution, 60 million people died of starvation. And now you're offered a buck a day or a buck a week. I don't care what the amount is. It's an improvement in your standard of living. You are better off. And if you talk to the Chinese laborers, they know it. And the good ones, the hardworking ones, the productive ones, they learn from it. So they go in and they start at a buck a day. But they learn and they get better. And now they're making two bucks a day. And one day... They'll make 10 bucks a day or 100 bucks a day or 1,000 bucks a day or they'll become a millionaire. There are plenty of those in China today who started from nothing. But if you don't get them started, 
We went through that period in the West during the 19th century. Yeah, people worked and made very little. But it was better than the alternative. China has to go through the same thing. There's no shortcut. They're getting a huge shortcut. What's the shortcut China's getting relative to America, to the West in the 19th century? Capital from abroad. Yeah, capital from abroad. We've already done the hard work. <laughs> we built this capital reserve. We built the machinery. We built the technology. They can import it like that. And they can grow immediately. So their standard living, what we did in 100 years, they're doing in 10. That's why China is growing so much, because of our expertise. But if you deny them the ability, if Apple says, oh, no, we're not going to build in China, or if we do build in China, we're going to pay people 10 bucks an hour now, because I'm not going to buy this for 400 bucks, because it's only worth 350 to me. Then they have to lay off all those people in China, and those people go back to the farms, and they starve to death. But that's the alternative. When, when Nike built shoes in Indonesia and kids are involved, now, again, there's unethical behavior where people are, people are being beaten, where people are forced to work. Put that aside. We all agree that force against people is wrong. But if people are volunteering to go to work, it means that their time is worth what? We, we did this in the beginning. If somebody is willing to work for a dollar a day, it means that their time is worth how much? Less than a dollar a day. Because the alternative to working is worth less than a dollar a day. So a dollar a day is an improvement in their lives. If you deny them that improvement, you are killing them. So it's easy in the West to sit back and say, oh, no, that's unacceptable. Let's stop that. But what you're doing is you're killing poor people who can't afford to be killed. Well, nobody can afford to be killed. You're killing poor people. And, and it's tragic. I mean, who are the... You know, we see this over and over again. I, you know, I'll give you another controversial example. Um, we sit here in the West and we worry about global warming. And I don't want to get into the scientific debate because it's not important in my view. I mean, it is important, but for, this, for, my, for the purpose of, of, of my discussion, it's not important. So what are we going to do about it? Now, if I were facing a problem, let's say it was true, and I said, oh, there's global warming, I'd say, okay, what can we do to change that? What can we do to protect ourselves? What are the risks? You know, let's build bigger dikes. Let's put something in the atmosphere to cool the earth down. I don't know. Let's figure it out. But no, the solution that we all have accepted in the West is we need to shut off the CO2 emissions. Otherwise, we need to kill fossil fuel. Now, we're pretty rich. We can afford to stupid, you in Spain particularly, right, can afford to spend huge amounts of money on solar energy. That's a, right, you've done this. You've seen the consequences of wind panels, right, and all this stuff. But what is Africa going to do? What is Africa going to do? They're dirt poor now. They have nothing. How are they going to become rich without carbon fuels? They can't. There is no scientific, there's no economic, there's no conceivable way Africa will ever become wealthy unless they burn massive quantities of CO2. I mean, of fossil fuel and emit CO2. That's just a fact. So we in the West, again, we're middle class, we're comfortable, we're, great, we're doing good, right? We can afford to waste a lot of money because our standard of living is pretty high. But what we're doing is condemning, and this is why India and China and Africa hate things like Kyoto. They hate climate change deals because they're the ones who are being screwed more than anybody else. Because what we're basically saying is you'll always be poor. The technology that helped us get rich, you don't get any of that because, because we've decided that it's better for you to be poor and cool than rich and warm. I don't know where that comes from. I like, I'd rather be rich and warm and buy lots of air conditioning than poor and cool. And I think every human being on the planet would rather be warm with air conditioning. The solution to global warming is air conditioning on a massive scale. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I live on the edge of the desert. I mean, I could live there if there was no air conditioning. It's too hot. Hi. Um, uh, where do you think the, the traditional moral code comes from? And why it has survived through all the history of mankind? Where does the, the current moral code come from? The traditional, moral, the traditional code. moral code. So I think the traditional moral code comes from, um, comes from really, uh, you know, one source, and that is 
people who want to control you. Altruism, I think, was invented in tribal society. You know, this is collectivism, but it, but it manifests itself in altruism. The leader of the tribe has a huge incentive to tell you not to live for yourself, because that will undercut his authority, but to live for the tribe, to sacrifice for the tribe. And, to sac and who knows what the tribe wants? Who reads the minds of the tribe? Who knows what that collective consciousness needs? Well, he does. Or if it's not him, then he has a witch doctor right next to him. And the witch doctor communicates with the spirits and tells you all what you should sacrifice for. But he's the only one who communicates with the spirits. So that you don't know what's good and what's wrong, and that's how he gains his power. So altruism is a way for people in power to control you. And it was invented by them in order to subjugate all of us to them. Because if you live for yourself, you might reject the authority. You might want to know the truth for yourself. You might open your eyes and say, wait a minute, this isn't right. I don't accept what you're saying. So the witch doctor and Attila, the Hun, right, the, the, the political leader, get together, religion and politics get together to teach you what is right and what is wrong and how you should behave and what is right or wrong, what is wrong in terms of their interests, their interest core power is to tell you that sacrifice is good because they now tell you who to sacrifice to. And it's always to them, right? It's always to the group that they control. Now, how did altruism become entrenched in our world to the degree that it has? Because there was always a tension. Greece, ancient Greece was not altruistic. Ancient Greece did not have the ethics that we have. They would think we're barbarians given our ethics. Even Plato, who is a collectivist and, and was awful politically, believed that the purpose of morality is to find your own personal happiness. It's to define that and to, and to, and to figure it out. The fundamental ethics of Greece is self-interest. So the real power, the, 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 the thing that brought about altruism into the West to dominate the West is Christianity. I mean, think of the symbol of Christianity. The symbol of Christianity is Jesus on a cross, suffering. For whom? For you. For all of us. Talk about guilt. I mean, this is the masterstroke. This is an act of genius to come up with this idea. Because we all feel guilty now. He, I mean, there's no worse suffering than being on a cross. I mean, this is why it's chosen. This is why the Romans chose it, and this is why the Christians chose it. There's no worse suffering, there's no worse pain than dying slowly on a cross. For us, not for himself, for you, you owe him big time. <laughs> it's enormous guilt-inducing. And beyond that, it's a moral symbol. This is what we should all be like. The moral ideal is sacrifice. For whom? For others. What's that? For the sinners, for the worst people. That's right. right? The best sacrifice is to sacrifice for people that you least have an interest in. I'll give you, again, a Bill Gates example. Right? Bill Gates has a lot of money, and he's giving it away. He could give it away to charities in Seattle. He lives in Seattle. Right? There's a lot of homeless people in Seattle. There are a lot of problems with teenagers and drug use and a lot of things that you could do with money to help people in Seattle. But that would be selfish because he lives there. So Bill Gates chooses the place that is furthest away from Seattle. Like he, he did, took a string and he said, where's the furthest away? So nobody could accuse me of being self-interested. And he picked Africa. And he's putting money into Africa. To show, to show that it's, it's no self-interest. This is not related. This doesn't affect my life in any bit. To show that it's a sacrifice, as close to a sacrifice as it could be. Because that's Christianity. That's what it's ingrained in us. Self-interest means pursuing your own values, not sacrificing to others. Not sacrificing the meek. The meek shall inherit the earth. Why? That's virtue. Virtue is being meek. Strong, that's a vice. So, 
Christianity institutionalized it, and Christianity has made it the dominant ethical code for 2,000 years, and that's why it's so difficult to overcome, because it's in our cultural genes, if you will. It's part of the culture. It's part of our literature. It's part of our, our religious services. It's part of what we believe it means to be human. But it wasn't before Christianity, and it doesn't have to be post-Christianity. But, but that's why it's so hard, because it challenges the very core of Western civilization, in a sense. Okay. Um, well, I'm from the border between Mexico and the U.S., and, well, I'm living right here in Spain right now, but I've noticed that in all three countries, uh, politics is really, really deeply uh, intertwined with the business world. How are the John Galtz and the Dagnes of today, how, how are they supposed to cope with, this huge mixture because it's one of the main things that I guess like in all three countries I've been that just doesn't let a lot of entrepreneurs yeah. move forward. It's in the whole world. I mean, the, well, with, one of the things that is killing us today is cronyism. It, it's the mixture of business with government. It's the influence of government on business and business on government. And, and at some point you lose track of who's who, right? Because they're so intermingled. And you see that in the banking sector in the United States, particularly with the big banks, but you see it, you see it in the technology sector, you see it all over the place, and, it, and it's tragic. Um, and I'll give you an example before I get to kind of the, the full answer. Uh, Bill Gates is a great example of this as well. How much money do you think Bill Gates, Microsoft, spent on lobbying Congress for favors, for, for stuff like that, before... Like uh, before 1995, in the early days, when he was making all his billions and billions of this, how much money did they spend? Exactly zero. Nothing. They didn't have a law firm in Washington. They had no office space in Washington. They did no lobbying. They didn't ask the government for any favors, nothing. They stayed away. And in 1995, there was a hearing in Congress. Uh, Senator Hatch, who happens to be a Republican, because it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, um, he... He had a, a bunch of Microsoft executives, and he said, and he yelled at them. There's, he yelled at them. There are transcripts of this. You need to start lobbying. You need to start bribing me, right? It's not what he said, but that's what he implied. You need to build an office in Washington, D.C. You need to hire Washington, D.C. lawyers. You need, to do, you need to do cronyism. A year after that, the Justice Department went after Microsoft for antitrust, right, and sued them. And Microsoft spent the next five years in court and lost and had all kinds of bad things happen to them. It's no accident that Microsoft has declined since then. How much money do you think today Microsoft spends in Washington, D.C.? Tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Because it has to defend itself. I mean, it has to. Now, what happens when you start out defending yourself? What happens very quickly? is it slips into doing more than defending yourself. So now Microsoft asked the Justice Department to go after Google for antitrust stuff, which is horrific, right? But that's the nature of this process. So the first thing to understand is what causes cronyism, in my view, and, this, and, this is, and Rand's view here is different than a lot of libertarian views, is not business. What causes cronyism is government. Government puts a gun to the back of your head and you say, okay, we'll pay you off. And because this transaction happens lots of times, it, it's reciprocal, right? So now I'm paying you not to just remove the gun from my head, but to put it on my competitors. But the process gets started and is accelerated because of government power. Um, so the solution to it is not to attack business. It's to attack government. It's to get, it's to separate government from business. It's to basically take the gun away from the government. It's to tell government, you cannot intervene in the economy. So I am a strong believer in the separation of government from, from economics. Government shouldn't have any economic policy. It shouldn't be capitalist. It shouldn't be socialist. It should have no economic policy. Protect property rights. Protect individual rights. Protect us from crooks and thieves. And that's it. You shouldn't have monetary policy because you shouldn't have a central bank. You don't redistribute money because you shouldn't redistribute. You shouldn't regulate. You shouldn't control. Government should have no role in the economy. Zero. You don't need a minister of the treasury because you don't need a treasury. Government becomes much smaller. 
In the 19th century, government, the federal government in the United States never spent more than 4% of GDP, except during the Civil War, except during wars. 4% of GDP. How much does it spend today? And, and we got the Industrial Revolution, explosion of middle class, explosion of growth. GDP has never grown faster. Today, how much does government spend? In the United States, 22%. Federal. If you add state and local, it's over 40. That's why it's very similar to Sweden. Sweden is like 48, and the United States is 42% of GDP. Not a big difference. 4% uh, to 22% on the federal level. You could cut government spending today by 80 to 90% and have the size of government you had in the 19th century was, and have maybe the economic, the economic performance of the 19th century. What a businessman, sh what should they do? They should fight government control. I mean, the Dagnes and the Rita should stand up and say no. Um, now, they're going to have to give in because they've got a gun pointed at them. But they should give in while protesting. Uh, I'll give you an example. John Allison in the United States uh, was uh, CEO of a bank called BB&T. And when top, it was the bailout of the banks, came about, the government said, we want to give you a check to bail you out. He said, I don't want a check. I don't need to be bailed out. And then they took a gun and they pointed it at him and they said, yes, you do. <laughs> and they said, you don't have any choice. You have to take this check. Otherwise, we'll shut you down. So he took the check and he protested. And he said, this is wrong. I don't need this. I don't want this. The government shouldn't be bailing banks out. I have to do it because I have my fiduciary duty to shareholders. But I do it under protest. If every CEO today did that, then I think people would wake up and I think, I think you would reverse the trend. But the likelihood of CEOs doing that is very small, unfortunately, because they don't believe it. You know, they first have to believe it. They first have to be Dagny's ideologically, not just, I mean, there are a lot of Dagny's and Reardon's out there, if you've read Atlas Shrugged, in terms of their productive ability, but there are almost none in terms of their philosophical understanding. Yes, uh, I'm aware that you don't have this parallel universe to point out to, but maybe you can <laughs> help me out with this. Um, sure. uh, don't you think that some societies need, like, as a push to start being productive uh, and thrive, um, some help from the state, as in building infrastructure, building roads, uh, ports. Uh, I mean, you gave the example of Hong Kong and Singapore, right? Uh, I'm assuming that they had some help with building the ports that they have over there. I mean, Hong Kong has a lot of islands, so I'm guessing they have bridges too, and they need some of that help from the state to, to begin with. So Hong Kong started on, on one island. I don't know who built the port of Hong Kong. It's a good question. I'll have to, I'll have to do some research and find out. No, I don't think it's necessary. Um, what the state needs to do in order to, in order to, I mean, in order to create success is define property rights. But in defining property rights, what they need to do is define property rights over everything. And that includes the waterfront, it includes the rivers, it includes the roads, it includes the pathways to give people an economic opportunity to make money off of building a road, to make money off of building a bridge, to create that infrastructure and be rewarded for building that infrastructure. But The only way that government can build infrastructure is how? How does government build infrastructure? By taking money from you, and I'm assuming you're all poor because we live in a very poor country. We don't have the infrastructure. Taking money from poor people and building roads. But maybe poor people, maybe they have a different idea of how to spend the money. Maybe it's much more productive. Maybe to raise their standard of living much faster than what some government bureaucrat decides, I need a bridge right here. Maybe that's not the best place to build a bridge. All you need to do is define property rights. There's, a, uh, there's an economist from Peru who happens to have the same name as a famous economist from Madrid, uh, De Soto, Hernando De Soto from Peru. And he's got a book called Capital Ideas. And he says, he says something very simple. In all these countries in South America, poor people live on land which they don't own. The land is typically owned by the state. I, I'll give you a, an example of this. I, we were recently in Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro is, an, is the most beautiful, geographically the most beautiful city in the world, in my view. It's just amazing, right? But what's fascinating about Rio is you know who has the best real estate? 
the favelas, the very, very, very poor people. They live up on the hills. The stupid middle class rich people all live down below. So if you want to get a beautiful view of Rio de Janeiro, you go up into the favelas. You could end, in a sense, you could end poverty, at least in that region of Rio de Janeiro, like that. By doing what? Given the property rights over what, where they live already. They've been living there for decades. And it's state-owned, which means nobody owns it. So you might as well give it to them. It's not like you're confiscating it from somebody else. And what will they do with it? They'll sell it. They'll sell it to resorts and rich people who want to build villas up there. And they'll sell it to people who want this amazing view. And they'll move down into where the middle class lives and the rich will move up there. Right? And everybody's a winner. It's a win-win. And it's cost you zero. All it means is defining property rights. This is the amazing thing about what DeSoto says, and it's kind of obvious to me. Defining property rights creates wealth. Because suddenly, you've got a piece of land that you could mortgage. You could use that money to start a business. Suddenly, you have capital. You've created capital out of thin air. So that's all you need. And how do you build roads? How do you build infrastructure? People will figure it out. People come together to build it. In America, in the, in the early 19th century, the government did not build roads. The government did not build canals. Private entrepreneurs built roads and canals. And then the government took them over and then built, started building their own because they were smarter and they knew where to build the roads. They didn't, you know, they wanted to control where things moved. But private entrepreneurs want their goods to get from point A to point B. And if there's no road, guess what they'll do? They'll build one so that they can make money. So, no, I don't think you need a fresh start. All you need, again, is, is the rule of law, protection of property rights, protection of safety. Like one of the absurdities in Brazil is that you can't walk in the street at night without fear of being mugged. So the one thing the government should be doing, protecting you physically, they don't do. But that's the thing. The one thing the government should do is to protect you, protect you from coercion, crooks and bad guys. I know for you, you have been traveling a lot in Europe and I guess to other continents as well. How are our Ayn Rand ideas accepted internationally? So um, it's still very small, the number of people who are even willing to consider Ayn Rand's ideas, but it's growing dramatically. So 10, 15 years ago, you couldn't come to Europe and speak about Ayn Rand. There was nobody. There was nothing going on. Um, the books weren't translated in many languages, or they'd been translated a long time ago, and then they went out of print. Uh, there, were no, there was really no interest out there. And, and this is certainly true in Latin America and, and, and in Asia. Today, you know, I could probably spend every week of the year traveling somewhere in the world to speak about Ayn Rand. The demand is there. It, 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 her books are translated into pretty much every language. Every language. I mean, three different Indian languages in India uh, into most European languages. It's certainly every major. I mean, the big breakthrough when we knew we kind of were on the right path was when uh, the last, may, you know, the, the, who are the last people you think to translate Ayn Rand into their language? What? Russians. No, Russians did it a long time ago. <laughs> we were the last, Chinese did it. Chinese did it a few years ago. But who finally last year had a translation done of At the Shrugged? The French. <laughs> <laughs> so things things are looking up when the French think that that translation of At the Shrugged is uh, worthy. Of. No, I mean it's it's pretty amazing it, in Czech, in Bulgarian, in Greek, in in so. It's, it's on the rise, but to say that a lot of people are not. It's still a small group, but it's growing. The interest is growing. You're seeing it more on campuses. You're seeing more professors interested in it. Certainly in the United States, 20 years ago, she wasn't taught anywhere. I mean, a few places here and there. Today, they're probably, I don't know, somewhere between two to 800 different classes in the United, different professors in the United States teaching Ayn Rand at any given semester, right? That's, you know, that's new. So it's definitely on the rise, whether it's on the rise fast enough, whether it's, you know, it hasn't reached real scale. 
that it's very different than it was. And, and, and a lot of philosophers taking her seriously for the first time ever. She never was taken seriously by the philosophy profession when she was alive. The last 10 years has seen real interest among philosophers in her ideas, which is, which is amazing. Um, given, given that it is extremely difficult to change the moral code, uh, let's look um, further. How do you see the free city movement? The free city movement. I think the free city movement is a great idea that's completely unrealistic. I don't think it can happen. I don't think it can be done. It's the same as the, the floating islands ideas. and Nobody will let you build a free city. And if they do, and you're successful, they will shut it down. No, I mean, think, think about it. It's really free. I mean, if it's another compromise, then what have you done? But if it's really free, I'll, I'll give you an example. You have a free city, or you have a free island, or you have whatever. And free islands have... Um, Free banking, which means privacy. How long is it going to take before the Marines show up at your door if you're not disclosing all the information about your banking practices to the American Federal Reserve? I mean, in my view, very little. So I've got a solution, but nobody will listen to me. But I've got a solution for how you make free cities work. And it involves nuclear weapons. <laughs> and I'm serious. I'm not joking. You need one targeted to Washington, D.C., and you need them to believe that you would use it. And then they'll leave you alone. But short of that, they'll shut you down. They'll find a way to shut you down. That's my, that's, that's my belief, existential belief. There's no, there's no shortcuts. Um, plus, and this is the second part, the deeper part, if you will, philosophically. Even if it was successful, unless the people in the free city adopted this new morality, it won't last. It won't last. There will be pressures from within to start compromising, to start appeasing. There'll be somebody who needs something and charity won't be enough to fulfill their need. And there'll be pressure to use coercion to just for this one time, because this is what happened in America. America was pretty good in the beginning. I mean, not perfect. There were a lot of flaws, but it was pretty good historically. And you can see the erosion very slowly from the beginning. And it's always, always using the altruistic instinct. It's always, look, somebody there, they just need a little bit of fire, destroy their home. Let's not, let's collect from our own money and contribute. Let's take a little bit of tax money and give it to them. And if it's to them, what about to them? And what about to them? And what about to them? And need is a moving target, right? What people, and it, it diminishes the freedom very, very quickly. So without the philosophical revolution, at least for the people who are in the city, it, it, it won't last. You know, I think it's a great experiment, you know, all the parts. I just don't think it could, you know, because of the nuke problem, I don't think it can survive. Because, I, I mean, I think, I think the United States and other countries are serious about this. I mean, I, I, I think they're willing to use military force to shut freedom down. I, I just don't think they'll let it thrive because, because they know who it threatens. It threatens them. It threatens the powers to be. And the powers to be are just too powerful at this point in history for us to think that we can create an enclave and, 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 and win. Um, I wish, I, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, um, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, you know, it's about the situation with this girls, these Nigerian girls that have been kidnapped by radical Muslims in, and what do you think, what uh, the USA and the Western world should what I do about this? And the second question is about uh, um, what's your view uh, on Alexander Hamilton? Because I recently um, read uh, Thomas Jefferson and it was horrible. So <laughs> and I, I think uh, he was better than, uh, than that. So that's So let me do Nigerian girls, it's easier. Um, look, as an isolated incident in Nigeria, the Western world should do nothing. I mean, it should condemn it because it's horrific. It's morally offensive. It's disgusting. You know, all the terms, all the evil terms you want, you should list. But I don't, I, there's absolutely no reason an American boy, my son, should be sent over there to die for the sake of 
I mean, it's sad, and we should all sympathize with how sad it is. But the only thing the West could do is send troops. And sending troops, I mean, American troops, in my view, should, their lives should only be put at risk to defend the individual rights of Americans. They should never be put at risk to defend the individual rights of somebody else. That's somebody else's problem. I mean, this is, I'm self-interested, and I'm not embarrassed to say so. I'm proud of it. Um, this is a standard, I believe, for going to war. You should be able to look your own child in the eyes and say, this is a war I want you to volunteer and go and fight. Because it's my life and your life is at stake, and therefore you should fight it. If you can't do that, if you wouldn't volunteer yourself, or you vo wouldn't volunteer your own child, then how can you ask somebody else's child to go fight the war for you? I mean, as good as the cause might be. Now, the issue of radical Islam or, or military Islam is a much bigger is a much bigger issue, and the West does have obligations there because I believe the West is being threatened by them directly, and therefore it needs to deal with them. But to take the the issue of Nigeria in isolation doesn't make any sense. The West should have responded to 9/11 and your bombings and and everything else in a way that it didn't respond. And you know we're dying. The West is dying, and 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 you know we're exhibiting all the signs. Of, of somebody who has no moral confidence, no backbone, no self-esteem, no self-assertiveness, and we're letting the barbarians into the gate, which is, which is what Rome did and what we're doing right now. I mean, it, it's happening all over again, and we've learned nothing from history. But that's a whole different question. Hamilton. Hamilton. I'm not an expert on the Founding Fathers, but it's enough for me that Hamilton was a strong advocate for a central bank I mean, central bank, in my view, is one of the worst economic entities out there. It is, it is a, it is, a, it distorts the distribution of wealth away from a meritocracy to who is in favor at any given point in time. It is a form of central planning. We know central planning doesn't work, so let's take the most important price in the entire economy, interest rates, and give it to a bunch of bureaucrats to decide. It, 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 you know, all you have to do is, is ask how much is the dollar worth today relative to before the central bank was established. It's every dollar is worth three cents. It's being devalued by 97% because of the wonderful Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression. Federal Reserve caused the inflation of the 70s. And the Federal Reserve caused, in my view, the current economic crisis. In my, there's no question about that. Economists will be writing about this. In 10 years, it'll be conventional wisdom that Alan Greenspan in Fed policy, monetary policy, caused the 2008 crash. Just like today everybody knows, everybody in economics knows, that the Great Depression was caused by the Federal Reserve. So just the fact that Hamilton was for that and generally was for strong federal central government is a weakness. Look, they were all flawed. Jefferson was flawed. But Jefferson was a great, great thinker and a great, great man in spite of that. Thank you for your talk. It has been very interesting, and thank you for coming to our institute here. Uh, let me state clearly that I agree with a lot of what you had said, and I like, I sympathize with objectivism, but I have never considered myself an objectivist because I, I see several problems with it. And I don't know if it will be possible to correct them, because objectivists tend to kind of idolize Ayn Rand, and uh, if she has said something, they kind of take it for granted and, and maybe don't, don't, don't discuss it. One of the things which is, I think, either incomplete or wrong is the emphasis of reason and maybe not understanding emotions and, and moral emotions or moral sentiments. You have said that man is special or man's best, best virtue or, or best ability is its, its reason because we are weak. So I cannot survive uh, a lion, or I, I, I'm not very strong. But there is a, another solution to that that does not imply, let's call it abstract or technical intelligence, which is grouping social cohesion. And not the kind that happens in the markets, because there what you have is impersonal relationships that just come and go. This is studied in evolution right now in, in biology, and it is very important to understand how some animals live individual lives and, and other animals are highly social. In order to have social lives, you need to have a special brain, a brain that can process social relationships 
and human intelligence, it is thought right now, and I think correctly, that we are so intelligent that because we have to process a lot of information about social relationships. We are not as good when, when dealing with the physical world or physical stuff. We just get by, but we are very good at, at dealing with, with, with other people. And not only intelligent, but you need the motivations to live in society. So you need to consider the well-being of others. You cannot have a stable society if people are constantly telling each other, hey, I'm only here because I'm looking after me because I'm number one and I will only be with you, my darling, my, if, if, if you want someone to be your girlfriend, as long as it pleases me and then I will leave you. It's exactly what we do, by the way. <laughs> exactly what we do. Exactly. It's, it, is, it is part of what we do, but it would not be possible if you did not have a feeling of guilt, which is not, it can be abused or induced culture, but if you don't have some remorse in doing some things that you know are also going to affect others. But, I mean, if, if those feelings make you feel bad, so in the end you are, uh, it's the idea of rational selfishness or enlightened selfishness is, is, is also that. But So when, when it, it is necessary to, to understand why do we, we have altruist feelings, feelings for others, and how they can be abused. I think Ayn Rand is great because altruism is so abused by, collect, by communists and socialists that it needs some, some, someone to fight against it. How do you define altruism? Oh, in biology, you define it as no. something that gives a benefit to someone else and implies a cost to you. With if, no benefit to you. If it... If it if that were the whole story, altruism cannot evolve. I mean, it would be something very weird. What really happens in social groups is that you have reciprocal altruism, which means today I give it to you and tomorrow you give it to me, help or goods or, or whatever. Apart from that, there is also indirect reciprocal altruism, which means I give to you and I will receive from someone else before, because people in the group see each other and then you build networks and yet you try to associate with people who are helping others and who have a good reputation in the group. And then the higher form of this indirect altruism is that, and as individualists we are, we are not going to like uh, what I say, but this is true, is that the group becomes an entity in, on its own level. The same way that we are multicellular entities and we are descendants of individual unicellular organisms that develop such strong interactions that then they stopped being able to live independently and appeared as, as a unit. Then the group, that primitive tribe, is a unit to which you contribute and which helps you. It defends you, it helps you in, in, in case of need. I have found it interesting when you say the, the chief of the tribe uses these ideas to control you. That is partly true, and it is very important to emphasize it, but it's not the whole story. I mean, the group also needs those ideas, those messages of let's help each other, let's avoid uh, being too selfish because if we do not help one another, we will end up individually, and if we try to live individual lives, we will... We will, we will like. I mean, this is a long comment. I would just like objectivists to deal with these issues so that their ideas are, are more complete, so that they just don't say that usual A is A and use reason. And I, I would say, try to understand the motions, try to understand why you have them. So, so I think we do try to do all that. We just disagree. So, I think that the science of evolution as applied to human behavior as compared to evolution from materialistic, you know, just from the gene perspective, is still very young. And I think the scientists who are mostly doing the work have been brought up in a certain philosophical context and are motivated to come to certain conclusions. I think it's way too early to come to those conclusions. And I'm, I'm not an expert, so I'm not, I'm not an expert, but 
you know, objectivists who have looked into this disagree with a lot of the conclusions about, you know, uh, the way evolution influences our behavior. For example, I don't believe that you evolve to have ideas. Ideas are conceptual things that don't pass through evolution. And I believe that emotions are consequences of ideas. They don't proceed, most complex emotions, don't proceed from a genetic stimuli, but proceed from a conclusion that you've come to. And you can see that in how our emotions change when our ideas change. You can introspect and observe this. You have an emotion towards something, you learn something new about that something, your emotion changes. So your emotions follow conclusions that you've come to, not the other way around. Now, again, we could have a long conversations about this and we would have to delve deeply into the science, which I'm not ready to do because I'm not an expert on this. But to accuse objectivism of not looking into it is unfair because I don't think it's true. We disagree. One of us is right and one of us is wrong. <laughs> you think I'm wrong. I think you're wrong. We can discuss this. I mean, we should discuss this more. The conversation should happen. I, if objectivists ever say, you know, <laughs> bring up the garlic or whatever you do, right? We don't want to talk about that. Then they're wrong. Then they're being dogmatic and, and wrong. It's a conversation that needs to happen. We need to understand the science better. But my view is the science is motivated by a certain philosophy. And the philosophy comes and the conclusions from the science are motivated by that. And I think this affects science broadly. It's not just the evolutionary psychology or uh, that it's affecting. it's affecting. It's affecting it broadly. I mean, I would love to have an objectivist, a, a, an advocate of Ayn Rand, who was an expert in this and who wrote about it, and it interpreted the results differently. The, the way I think, I think a, a, a rational philosophy that doesn't just accept the past would. I, I don't think we benefit from tribal society. I know the story is if we didn't have tribes, we would all die. I don't believe that. I don't believe there's an evolutionary advantage to being a tribe. I, I, you know, altruism, to, altruism, you know, there's a, I mean, the vagueness of the, of the definition of altruism, yes, there's a certain sense in which objectivism says you help other people because they're human, because they're a value to you. Human life is a value to me, right? All life is, I water my plants. Because life, I like to see life thrive. We have pets that we treat well. Not because they give us something in terms of money, but because they give us something in terms of a sense of, of thriving life, of successful life. They, they, they benefit us somehow psychologically. Well, human beings are better than plants and pets, in my view, at least. So yes, we want to help other people because there's a value there that we get out of it. That's not altruism. That's within my the context that I might help you, I might not help you, but if I help you, Ayn Rand argues, objectivism argues, they sh it should be because you are value to me in some way and I'm not giving up more than I'm receiving. In the long run, I mean, think about having kids. Talk about the long run. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. Yet kids are wonderful. And you gain huge benefits from having kids. But it's a long-run perspective on self-interest. It's not instant. Right? When you wake up at 2 in the morning and the kid's crying, you don't get anything instantaneously in return for feeding them and patting them on the back and calming them down. So, of course, self-interest means a long-term and a sense in which there's reciprocality. I might help a stranger with the hope that he goes and becomes a productive human being out there, works, and makes my life better in that sense. But that, I don't need a genetic explanation for that. There's a moral existential, but I'm not going to help the stranger if I'm rushing to the hospital because my kid needs me, right? Because that's more important of a value than that. So it's an issue of a higher, and I'm not going to help a stranger if I think they're a bum and will never work and will never do anything with their life. So I think two things are happening. One is we're creating a caricature of what objectivism is. You only help somebody if they give you cash right then and there. That's not objectivism. That's never been objectivism. It's not what I, I mean, you forget that Dagny feeds the bum on the train, right? Why does she feed the bum on the train? Because she's interested. She's curious about him. There's a value there. There's a trade going on. And she senses he's basically a good person falling on bad times. And if she helps him out a little bit, he'll become a good person. That's a value to her, having good people out. 
So I think there's a superficial understanding about what Ayn Rand means by self-interest. And then I think, and then I think, then I think we have, once we can clear that up, that'll be good. <laughs> and then we can discuss about how much of what we are is driven by genes, by evolution, in terms of cognitively and emotionally what we are, and how much of it are we a blank slate? So how much, how much do we start with a blank slate? And, and I think that's an interesting discussion to have, and I think it's, it's worthwhile having. It's not, I don't reject it. I don't have to find uh, I never meant to accuse objectivism of, of not dealing with it. If, if I have been understood that way, I'm sorry. I know Ayn Rand's thought. I mean, I have read yeah. most of her books and I have read objectivist ideas and I have talked with objectivists a lot. But I think they either deal with these issues, biological, evolutionary, psychologically, little or sorry, wrong. Uh, again, I think the, the problem is the opposite of what you say, that some scientists have some preconception and biases. I come from the natural sciences. I happen to be a free market, a freedom guy. And uh, the problem is that I say, hey, I want truth and freedom, uh, but truth also. I mean, if I, I if truth I Truth is always so, first. So, so, Nobody's uh, going to disagree on that. The problem is that when I argue these things about objectivists, I always get the same answers for, and I see the same reasons. The reasons in the sense that they want to put reason like in a, in a in a kind of pedestal, and when I start telling them about kind of the unconscious mind and things about like signal signaling theory, self defeat, uh, status relationships, things that are not really amenable to rational thought, they kind of don't like it or feel or feel uncomfortable. So I. I just, uh, whenever you want, we can continue discussing all these, all these. Sure, no, again, I, I think I think there's a lot of interesting science being done. I, at least, from my understanding, question the meaning that it's given. And and again, I don't think the essence here philosophically is to be free market. Free market is is way up there on the philosophical chain. It, it's it's these kind of issues relate to it, it beliefs about metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, and and. You know, the free market is just a consequence of those beliefs. So what you're challenging is their, their beliefs in epistemology and their beliefs of ethics. And that's tough. And that needs to be discussed and hashed out and fully understood. But we hold a position that in a, in a fundamental sense, not, again, don't take this as a caricature. We are born as a blank slate. Not, I know, I know you think that. And that's okay. I know you think that. And I said, again, not as a caricature of what, of what? It's, it's a question of what does that really mean? And I don't think we've explained, objectivism has explained what we think that really means, because clearly we're not all the same when we're born. We're clearly different. What sense in which we're different? What are, what are things you are born with versus what are the things you learn? Those are all interesting issues that need to be dealt with. And even after we deal with them, we might still disagree. But what is objective is to say one of us will be wrong. Oh, it could be that both of us are wrong. But there is one truth at the end of the day. 